As a kid, one of my favorite television shows was a show on OPB or PBS called uh, Reading Rainbow. And Reading Rainbow was a really cool show where kids would go on and talk about their favorite book and they would go on adventures. It also starred a guy from named LeVar Burton from Star Trek, which made it even cooler for me. In particular, there was one episode that really stuck out. And it was about a book called Hill of Fire. And it was a true story about a farmer in Mexico that a volcano grew overnight in his backyard. Now I say a true story because it actually happened. In fact, we can go to this place that the story is set. It's a place called Paracutin, Mexico. And in particular, the type of volcano that grew was called a cinder cone. And the episode made a huge effect on me. Well, in this, uh, this video, we're going to actually identify and talk about cinder cones. We're going to end up doing three different things. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify key characteristics of cinder cones, of volcanoes. And then we're going to compare them to other types of volcanoes. What makes them different from a composite or a shield volcano? Then we're going to identify ways that maybe we wouldn't have this uh, volcano happening overnight. Ways that um, scientists, volcanologists, and geologists can predict when a volcanic eruption is going to happen. Let's go back, though, to this book called Hill of Fire by Thomas P. Lewis. And it's actually a children's book. Um, it's one of those I can read books where they're teaching you to read. But it's a story of a farmer in, in Mexico, in Paracutin. And one night, he goes out in this field during the day, and he smells rotten eggs. And he thinks, oh, this is a little bit different. But he continues on his work until that night, when he goes to bed. In the middle of the night, he is awoken to an earthquake. He runs outside to see lights in his field, a reddish-orange glow. He initially thinks it's a fire, but over time, that rotten egg smell gets stronger. Eventually, in the morning, he realizes that that smell, those lights, were actually a volcano growing in his backyard. The people in the village, they freak out and think it's the end of the world, as I think I probably would too. The farmer himself gets very worried. Over the weeks and months, this volcano continues to grow. It eventually takes his entire farm. It takes out the village. The people that didn't leave initially have to be forced out of their houses because this mountain volcano, Paracutin, grows and takes it over. Now, the type of volcano that was there is called a cinder cone, and it's a very specific kind. In some of the other videos, I really like to compare volcanoes to different food groups, or food groups, like types of food. A great example, right? I said shield volcanoes are a lot like maple syrup. They like to flow and ooze. A composite volcano, well, that's kind of like a popcorn ball that's clumpy and all stuck together. And and it gets stuck on your teeth. But a cinder cone is a lot like movie popcorn. It's just loose. In fact, if you've ever been to a movie theater and watched them make the popcorn, that they've got this little kettle and the popcorn pop out of it as they heat up and they form a pile down below. If you really watch closely as they form a pile, they make a really nice cone. It's kind of, to me also, kind of like how when you uh, watch a dump truck and it dumps all the stuff out. It makes a perfect cone worth of dirt or rock or whatever it's dumping. Well, a cinder cone is kind of like that. It's a volcano that's popping out little rocks, like popcorn, and it creates a nice, perfect cone, a cinder cone. Now, we don't have to always just call the rocks coming out cinders. We can call them scoria, but it's the same thing. The earth is popping out these little scoria, and it forms a nice cone. And at the top, there's this little small crater, and it pops out. A cinder cone is created by felsic lava that's really shallow. So it's got silica in it, and it's sticky, but it's not deep enough to get a lot of lava to make a composite, and so you get a little shallow cone that pops out. And because of that, they form in groups, and they usually form a bunch of them together and around larger volcanoes. So you might find them next to a shield volcano, or you might find them next to a composite volcano because of where the lava, the magma, is coming from. And they form, like I said, a perfect cone made of basically kind of almost piling piles of rock on top of each other. Well, because of where they're at, they have a really short lifespan. In fact, if we look at the example of Paracutin, it erupted over a month um, and just stopped. 
whereas they might last a little bit longer, but they pretty much are short compared to composites and shields. Because they live such a short life and are just piles of rock, they also erode away very quickly. That's very different when you compare that to like a shield or a composite that erode away much slower because they're larger and have a harder rock. So really short-lived, but and they don't last long, but there's lots of them all piled on top of each other. Because of that, we see them all over the place. Anywhere that you find volcanoes, you're going to find some cinder cones. Here in Oregon, around the Cascades, uh, we call them a lot buttes. You'll see them called buttes. A perfect example, and maybe the classic cinder cone in my mind, is a place called Black Butte. And you can find this place as you're going to Sisters, Oregon. Um, it's this perfect cone. It's over 6,500 feet. It's really tall. It's kind of this greenish black because it's covered in ponderosa pine. And it's made from cinders, actually red cinders, piling up. And they're red because they're rusting. And they have iron oxide in them, the lava, the magma did. So you get these red cylinders, and it's a perfect cone. And as you're driving into Sisters, you can see this thing in the distance. And you can actually drive up it or hike it if you're really adventurous. It's a cinder cone. Well, cinder cones, like I said, they grow up really quick in Paracutina, a matter of overnight. And the farmer, the poor farmer, didn't have any ideas that it was growing. But things have gone a long way since the 1940s when Paracutin erupted. Volcanologists and scientists have come up with many ways to figure out volcanoes are going to erupt. And we have many months. In fact, in 1980, before Mount St. Helens erupted, we had six, seven months of knowing that this was going to happen. Well, now we have four different ways that we can predict that an earthquake is going to happen. And these are all clues. The first way is we can look for small earthquakes. In our story for the Paracutine and Hill of Fire, there are earthquakes, and that's maybe a clue that something's happening. Remember, a volcanic eruption is magma making it to the surface. And so when magma moves, it creates little earthquakes inside the earth. Now, we're not talking about anything large, maybe a 1, 2, or 3 on the Richter scale, but large enough that you could measure it, and we know magma is moving. Here in Sandy, there usually is a 1 or 2 earthquake, one on the Richter scale, once a week, because magma moves into Mount Hood. So the first way is we can look for small earthquakes. We then also can look for slope. Remember, I looked at Mount St. Helens. When we got closer to the eruption, there was a bulge. The hill, the land, started to slope. If the farmer in Paracutin could have looked back, he probably would have seen also there was a bulge before it actually happened. And now we have very precise measurements with GPS and some other tools where we can actually measure very specific the bulge. In fact, uh, you can look on the three sisters here in Oregon. There's another bulge, and at some point we might have a four sister in Oregon. Now that's many, many years away, but there's a bulge growing. There's slope. There's also volcanic gases. That's our third way. Remember, we saw that um, in our story in Hill of Fire, the farmer smells rotten eggs. And that smell, that rotten egg smell, is sulfur. And it happens in every volcano. It comes from the Earth. It's SO2. It also releases CO2. And scientists, volcanologists in particular, have set up tools that can measure the amount of these gases. If the gases are starting to increase, that means magma is closer to the surface and an eruption is closer. And so we can figure out how close we are to an eruption based on how much gases are there. And finally, and this is the latest one, using satellites from space, they can actually map, they, meaning scientists, geologists, can figure out exactly the temperature of our land and see if it's rising or falling. If it's rising, it might have closer to a volcanic eruption. So with these four things, we can figure out how close we are. And so something like paracutine could probably never happen today. You could probably never wake up in the middle of the night and find a volcano growing in your backyard. How frightening would that be? So that's a science, that's a good thing. So in this video, we did three things. We identified some key characteristics of cinder cones, which we said were these small, perfect cones of rock called scoria or cinder that pop out of the ground and form up, um, that they're very short-lived, and then they erode away very quickly because they're just a pile of rock. We then showed how they're different than the other types of volcanoes, shields and composites, because they're felsic, their lava comes from very shallow, and they don't live very long compared to the much taller and larger cinder cones, I'm sorry, shields and composite volcanoes. 
And lastly, we saw ways that we can predict volcanic eruptions. One, we can be looking for small earthquakes showing magmas moving. Two, we can look at area of the slope. Is the land bulging? Three, we can look for volcanic gases. And then finally, we can actually see if the air, the land is getting warmer from magma being closer. So let me remind you how these videos work. I know I talk really fast, and so you can always hit pause if you want to take some notes or go back and watch a certain section. You can take a break and come back and watch the whole thing again if you missed the whole piece of it. But always remember to keep moving forward.